Hey there, welcome to this session around Tableau CRM and uh, Einstein Discovery and how it's been improved and grown for the business science use within Salesforce. I'm Colin Linsky, I'm a Principal Solution Engineer at Salesforce and I'm a specialist in data science and AI. I've been doing this for pretty much all my adult life and um, I thought I'd spend some time today uh, reviewing it with a sort of practical head. Uh, but so sort of really, really getting behind the scenes of, of why things have been built the way they have and um, bust a few myths on, on the way through. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank all the sponsors uh, for their kind and generous uh, uh, support for this event. Uh, without it, I'm sure we wouldn't be here today. So thank you very much. So let's have a look at what we're going to cover today. The starting point really is about how we have come up with the toolkits that we have and, and why we're trying to solve particular business problems in the way that we are. So we'll spend a little bit of time looking at what sort of the Salesforce view of the business scientist is and, and what that role is and, and how that's supported. Uh, the big thing that we've done is to build a toolkit which sits natively within the Salesforce environment. And I really want to explore what native means and how that might be contrasted against other ways of being able to support business decisions uh, in the field. One of the ways that we can look at the toolkit is to break it down into a methodology. Uh, there are various methodologies out there. Um, I'm going to use one, which I'm very familiar with, um, but you can choose uh, any of your own, quite happy. Uh, but I'll do it just as a way of being able to, to break down the enormity of the tools that are a part of this toolkit so that you can see why it's been put together in the way it has and how it would help a business scientist do some uh, sensibly some very complex things uh, in the real world. Each of those pieces will be looked at under the various headings of that methodology, and we'll get to understand the some of, not, not every single nut and bolt of the whole thing, but, but some of the reasons why the things have been built in the way they have and, and the value they provide, really. And then we'll finish up uh, sort of summarizing the whole, whole session. So with that in mind, there's a couple of things I just want to put in front of you just to sort of set the scene, if you like. Um, we really are dealing with a, a sort of a, a very broad uh, toolkit that allows us to do some, some very, very serious things uh, in business. Uh, these are things that can become mission critical. These are things that people can rely on for their jobs. These are things that will ultimately affect either colleagues or will affect the customers that are at the far end of this process in a very real sense. So this isn't just hobbyist stuff. This is really proper production grade life cycle creation and management of these predictive models. And we really want to sort of spend some time looking at, at why it's really important to have these things in the place. The other thing that I'd like to do in this session is sort of bust a few myths as well. So it's taken a while to grow. And originally the Einstein discovery was all about sort of statistical analysis of, of, of different um, drivers of decisions and things. But it's been enhanced over the past three years or so uh, to really, really uh, tackle data mining and some of the real complex areas of getting predictive models into, into real business. <coughs> Excuse me. So I want to bust a few myths on the way through as well as uh, show, you, show you how it works. It's, um, it's going to show you a few things. It's going to show you absolutely everything, but it's going to talk about the main sort of highlights areas. And you might feel a little dissatisfied at the end because, well, quite frankly, there's so much stuff in here. I really don't have time in this session to take you through every, every little nuance and teach you all the bits and bobs. It really is to give you a theme about what's been built and why it all hangs together in the way it does. So there's loads of help. There's loads of resources, loads of videos. And of course, you can contact me and we'll take you through. And then the questions at the end as well, we'll take you through any of the particular questions or queries or, or worries that you have around any of these parts. We've only got 40 minutes, but I can guarantee you, pretty much guarantee you that you'll be learning something new uh, and you'll have a new appreciation of, of what we're building and why we're doing it. So there's my challenge. I've thrown that out on the table. Let's start off by looking at decision support and how that sits for the, both the business scientists, but also why inside the Salesforce environment we're approaching it the way we do. It would be great if everything inside Salesforce was intelligent, wouldn't it? It would just be fabulous if it did it all automatically. It was a sort of a mind reader or soothsayer. But quite frankly, a lot of implementations of Salesforce tend to be around getting the nuts and bolts in place, making sure that that, that processes are, are there, data and forms are, are, are really sort of aligned and working well. 
quite often that extra bit, that, that bit where someone can take away something or relieve some blind spots or, or perhaps introduce a new way of thinking, quite often that just gets left on the side. It, it appears too complicated. It, it appears too disjointed when it comes to sort of people's performance and how people are being monitored. It all looks a bit too complicated. So one of the things that we've done is sort of try and encapsulate all of that so that it's much, much easier to work with. Another reason why business uh, systems tend not to be very intelligent is there's quite fractionated. Things that the end user might deal with quite often are different systems to those that the colleagues that have to deal with those customers are dealing with. Uh, and as a consequence of this, disharmony means that you can't be particularly intelligent because they're sort of pinpoints that they're trying to sort of relate to each other and integrate. It becomes quite a sort of complex issue. If you've got a unitary whole, it's much, much easier to deal with that complexity within one environment and then add intelligence into that one environment. Facts, figures, data, processes, they tend to be the, the real nuts and bolts of how Salesforce is implemented. Again, getting insights into that, even if they're just prompts and just sort of visual cues or whether they could be hard-nosed predictions, that's the aim of the game, to make these things smarter, make them more efficient, make them more intelligent, make them more usable so that you can make better decisions and be more efficient, definitely, so you can get through more of these things that you need to do each day. Big problem that we have seen time and time again is around who owns the data and who sees what and who's allowed to see what and where it sits. These fiefdoms become very problematic. So having a process which collates the information and then makes sense of that information and then allows that information to be turned into insight and then drop that back into the user experience is really, really important. Going across those fiefdoms, taking a holistic view, being able to get a broad and wide view is, is utterly the nuts and bolts of what we're trying to get at here. Decisions are supported in lots of different ways. They could be from a very gentle sort of, uh, this is something you might want to pay attention to, right the way through to you must do this, or even a little further across the far side of actually just going to take it away from you. Just make that decision because it's, no, it's a no-brainer. There's nothing you need to worry about. We'll take that away. We'll have that as a process and we'll let you know we've done it maybe, or we'll just give you something that you need to handle. Everything else has been taken care of. It's a real spectrum on the way through. So creativity is needed to, to sort of understand and what these decisions could be and how the new world could look. The other, and I think this is probably one of the big areas why business science is so important to Salesforce, is that data mining, predictive modeling, they tend, and AI, they all tend to be sort of the realm of the few. That tends to be a group of individuals that are paid a lot, that are that are part of the business, uh, perhaps sometimes on the side a little bit, but they are technicians, they are they're, they're excellent groups of people, but they're in a different part of the business. Some of the tools that they use tend to be quite difficult. They tend to be quite sort of coding heavy. They tend to be very technical. There's a lot of background, a lot of research that you need to do, a lot of studying. That whole discipline is something that gets quite removed from the operational side of things. And, and it's very easy with all of those other things I've just been talking about to have this sort of disjoint of where the analytics sits on the side and not as part of the process. So with those backdrops, what we've done in Salesforce is to try and address the whole thing in one sort of big go. If we take decision support as being right, starting from the left-hand side here, well, obviously you could start with just a piece of paper and a pencil, work your way through sort of an implementation where you've got forms, you've got data fields, you've got different validation rules and things, stick on top of that some processes. Then we start to get into sort of nudges and pointers saying, I think you've got one of these, or I think you've got five of these to look at, which one of these should be the one that you want to pay attention to. We can then move further towards this nudges, the, the, the guidance side of things. That can get more and more intelligent where we start to bring in the wisdom of the masses. So predictive models are all about reviewing history, working out what's happened, getting to understand those drivers, quantifying them, and then putting those into production so that they then become automated at producing those insights, automated in that they're going to be producing the process, the drivers of those processes automatically within Salesforce. So that whole sort of spectrum where we've gone through from no support right the way through to potentially taking control of things is something that's really of great interest to both the Salesforce users in general, but particularly when you're starting to bring in insights. 
The basic parts on the left-hand side are what we might think of as being core Salesforce. Those are the, the, the normal sort of starting point for the implementations. Generally then we'd have analytics, which would be sat on the side, which would be a whole process of, of and, and, and technology as well, perhaps, and sitting in different applications that would tend to sort of sit on the side. It would enable you to get those little views of things or surface a, a, a prioritized list or maybe give you some insights in a graphical form or, or show you exceptions of things. Those things are sort of standard ways of being able to do analytics. We have on the far side then, getting that wisdom of the masses, building those predictive models, getting that quantified view of what's happened in the past and putting it into production. That's the realm of the sort of business science. What we've done is put them all together inside Salesforce. So this whole suite that we're talking about here in Tableau CRM is really part and parcel of this whole Salesforce experience. So the core side is then enhanced here with the Tableau CRM. And the main thing that we've done in this is to make it part of the whole environment, the experience, and the system and platform itself. Where we saw before, where sort of data science sitting as a sideline, as a project that sits on the side, then hopefully integrates, we've taken a different starting point. And that's all about integration, about natively having all of the stuff as part of the process, not having it as an integration. So let's have a look at what native, what, what do I mean by native? And, and let's explore why that's so important. Well, the sort of uh, moment is the obvious thing was, it's integrated in Salesforce because you log in and that's the studio where you do your work. That is a, an obvious sort of meaning for the word native, but there's more subtlety to it than that. And, and I think it's really important to understand why we've done this application within Salesforce in the way that we have. It's all part of the same platform. So wherever the instances of Salesforce, the, the, the core part, so when you've got the different clouds, the analytical toolkit is part of that. So whatever country you're in, whatever geography, whatever instance you're using, the technology is part of that stack. And so are the assets as well. So they, they live and breathe and, and exist within the same environment that the Salesforce operations are. And that's really important because it means there's no taking out, there's no shuffling things around, there's no disharmonization, there's no problems of being able to keep two sides of one story in communication with each other. It literally is part and parcel of the same environment. Another reason that native is important is that you can inherit straight away some of the key qualities of Salesforce. So being able to understand what users, roles, profiles, hierarchies, perhaps even giving custom settings to individual users and then being able to use those as part of the analytical framework is really, really important. Think about that in terms of when you've got a new user, that new user needs to inherit certain properties and qualities instantaneously when they log in and do things, you know, a new salesperson, a new support rep, um, a, a new technical support rep that's sitting on the side of a whole business process, just working their way into it. You don't want to have to go and call up IT and then have them create a new user and do something on a different system. It literally is all part and parcel of it and would inherit those qualities straight away. Partly because of that, but partly because we're part of this same environment, things like encryption, security, data visibility, and data ownership is obviously very important inside Salesforce and how it's being architected for your individual implementations. But we can honor that and we can take it as part of the analytical experience as well. It doesn't have to be recreated. It's their part and parcel. Things are implicitly understood about data properties all the way through the system. So immediately you understand what type of data it is, what role it has, where it sits. That's immediately understood in the analytical environment. And because of the, the things like objects and custom objects, visibility around data, the relationships, how those fields relate to each other and what the sort of limitations are, that's really a, a brilliant place to be honoring all of that, that we don't have to recreate it and end up exposing things that are security risks or things that we shouldn't want to do. We can additionally have on the native side of things, we can keep all of that and bring external data in so that that can inherit the, those, um, those qualities as well on security. The deployment, this is a real big area, and I come back to this several times, the deployment is really, really important. Deployment is part of the platform. It's not a separate technology. It's not an integration. It's not a separate process. It's absolutely part of it. And this last mile is where an awful lot of these projects have tended to fail. So we'll explore that in quite a lot of detail and, and find out exactly what that means to be native. Action framework is really important too. 
when Salesforce is set up with things like global actions and processes and flows, those can be part of the analytical experience. They tend to be completely unavailable to external analytical applications. Having it here as part of that same framework, being able to take action directly from an insight is incredibly important. For the end user experience, it's this glossy, smooth, single pane of glass that is an intelligent experience. It's Salesforce plus these insights all taken care of so that you can make a decision and do something straight away on what you see in front of you. Data exchange is really seamless as well because it's not passing things in and out. There's no integrations or there's no worries there. And the analytics are intrinsically part of that experience. So giving roles and permissions and giving people different views of their applications, we can feed and sit in and amongst all of that. So the analytics and insights becomes literally part of that experience. There isn't a head swivel, a chair turn, another screen, so someone gets a report or a dashboard or something. It's there right in front of them as part of that thought process, if you like, that chain of thought. We've put them all together, all of these tools I'm going to talk about, put them all together into one place, and you give access to this according to the people that want it. This toolkit is for builders, if you like, but what we'll see is how it all gets deployed and given to the end users. We'll do that right at the end of this session. This toolkit that we've got here is a sort of one-stop shop. You can break it into different components if you want to give uh, different roles to different people, but essentially everything you need is all in this one place. The assets, they're all controlled here, different things, and I've just highlighted one of the ones, the main ones we were talking about. These are the stories. These are the ways of getting that wisdom of the masses encapsulated and then having that ready to drop back into Salesforce and the operations that are in there. We've got a whole series of notifications, watch lists, subscriptions, all of those sort of interactive nudges and guidance. We've also got our way of being able to create and curate data, being able to understand more about the raw data and turn it into something which is more insightful and more about information than it is about just data. We've also got a way of controlling and governing the way that the models are built and they're managed and they're deployed and controlled inside Salesforce. So all of the tools are available to us in this one place. Let's start now. Let's sort of break these toolkit apart. And I thought one of the best ways of doing that was really to have a methodology uh, about how one approaches something like a data mining project. There are lots out there. Um, this one is called CRISPM, which is Cross Industry Standard Protocol for Data, mine, data Mining. And I say that it's got a series of steps. It's iterative. And as ever with these things, anyone who's done them will know that they're never finished. So we've got this thing that goes round and round in circles. So let's break it down into the pieces. Business understanding is where you start. You get to really appreciate what the domain is, what your business problem is you're trying to solve. In order to do that, you need to understand the data and you need some tools to help you understand the data. The data itself is just sort of raw. It's just ingredients. It's not a cake you want to eat. It's just raw ingredients in a shelf. We need to turn it into something that makes a lot more sense. So there's data preparation that's in, involved bringing together the ingredients. We might need to cook the ingredients, in which case we've got some modeling tools around there. We build the right kind of model. We also evaluate that model, make sure it's a good one, make sure it's actually gonna do a good job in the real world. And then finally, that real sort of fun part at the last bit there, that last mile of getting it back into operations. Having a model, having it evaluated and saying it's a really good model, but then never having it see the light of day is just pointless, it's just a hobby. If you get it back into operations, then that's where the real return on investment, that's where the value lies. So let's take that methodology and let's look at that toolkit and break them down as to how it's being supported and what the current thinking is with Tableau CRM's data science toolkit. First of all, from the business understanding, getting to understand the way that people make decisions in the business. Remember that spectrum that we've most spoke about before? Getting to understand the way that people make those decisions and get to understand uh, the, the steps that are, are in it, the things that are in people's minds and the things that are actions as a consequence of making that decision is really what this is all about in that data understand, that business understanding. We call them use cases. They're real world decisions that, that Salesforce users are gonna be making. And they're persona led, so people will make different decisions according to their roles, their, their, their uh, actions in the world. Um, but it's very much driven by how Salesforce has been put together in front of them. Uh, and that becomes an iterative process where getting insights means you might change the way that Salesforce is operating or new processes, for example. Um, 
just as small as are mostly there. What we can see here, and we'll see later on, is that some of these decisions can be taken outside of Salesforce, but then brought in, or different bits of data are external to Salesforce. You know, I might have looked up something on another data set. I might have had a feed from another data source somewhere that helps me make a decision. Some of that decision making is actually outside of Salesforce as well. So having it all brought together to bear in that Salesforce experience is, is part of this toolkit. Data understanding. This part is really sort of quite critical, really. This is where data science and data scientists spend a lot of time. And this is where a lot of work is done to, to both understand the data, but then to prepare it and, and make a real good representation, a sort of digital view of that decision making. Understanding the way that Salesforce has been set up, understanding that there are processes, there are rules, there are validations, there are things that are kicked off in flows that will control the way data works and control that user experience. That absolutely needs to be understood. So how you manage opportunities through stages, for example, is, is a really good starting point for understanding what data is available and getting to understand you know, the, the form of the data. Workforce decisions, things that people do in the real world, they drive business KPIs. And those KPIs that are really the, the core part of what we're dealing with here. The business scientist is looking for something that's valuable, that's something that's operational. Operational? Operational, even. Operable, I don't know, I'm making up words something that is really important to the business that then becomes the target of this modeling and this business science uh, uh, process the, the the decision is something that happens in the real world it's done for a particular outcome the business monitors it and the business needs it because that's the kind of thing that businesses make uh, make themselves available for customers for but that's how they derive value that then becomes the target. And we build models and help support those decisions around it using this toolkit. We've got the standard lenses, dashboards, and things that you'd have inside um, Tableau CRM that would help you understand sort of different patterns in the data. You can also go a little bit further and start to use some statistical analysis, things like Einstein Data Insights. They're, they're sort of great ways of being able to summarize quite a lot of complexity in the data. But then when you get to the real big kahuna here, you've got a whole load of complex data in the background and you're trying to work out which are the most important drivers which things really make a big difference and which ones are sort of sacred cows perhaps then actually don't make a lot of difference we need some real good technology to help us to do that so that's where stories come into play data preparation that's the next phase so we've spent our time we've got the business problem as a, as a business scientist we've also then understood the sort of the data landscape and the decision-making landscape. The next bit is to create a sort of digital view of that decision-making process. That's the data preparation stage, we call it feature creation inside data mining. One big myth is that all of this must sit inside Salesforce. Let's blow that out of the water straight away. A lot of decision-making that happens even within Salesforce is based on data which doesn't exist in Salesforce. And it doesn't have to in this toolkit. It's been created to allow you to curate very, uh, very insightful views, very real world based views of that decision. Some of it might be performance related data, transactional data, which exists in other systems. It's pulled together and we can make sense of it by creating features. And those features are things like how many, how often, how, how, did, how many times did you do something in the last three weeks? What's the trend? Is it upwards? Is it downwards? how much above or below a comparative group. Those things are features. They're not necessarily data points. They need to be created on the way through. So we'll do that using things, both data flows, which some of you will be familiar with, but also the new up and coming recipes, which are gonna take over from the data flows. We use real world data features, or we try and create real world data features by using things like windowing, aggregation, pivoting data, and all sorts of other kind of transforms that we might use. Some of those transforms will be more model based in themselves, things like clustering, category matching, sentiment analysis, or there might be straightforward just calculations and transforms, recoding and bucketing and those kind of things. What we're starting to do inside Salesforce is template some of those so that things like an opportunity win model, we're templating so that you can then have that as a starting point that will build out the data preparation for you, create those real world features, and then you're straight away into your business science project. So we've got the tools available to you, but we're also starting to package those up as well. 
This is a recipe. This is where we're spending a lot of money. This is where you're going to see loads and loads and loads of tools to help you go from raw data through to that sort of digitized view of that decision. Those creations of those features are something that you'll do for each of the business problems. And you'll find that those new data points become really more and more useful the more decisions that you start making. It's very easy to pull them all together into a process that happens automatically in the background. And that's what the real benefits of things like recipes are. So it's a really super duper, highly detailed and very, very feature rich data preparation and processing environment. It's part of the environment so that it's not you have to go anywhere else to do it. It sits there, it understands what Salesforce data is, it connects up to individual bits of data externally, has that on a regular process and always keeps track of what's going on in these systems. Very, very important to be able to get good data. Next step, as you remember, in this process uh, of this methodology process is about the model building. So we've got the business understanding, we've got the data understanding, we've created those individual data points which summarise what that decision making is all about. We're now moving into sort of getting that model building process, getting to quantify which are the important features, which are the not important features. Are some of the features needing a bit more tweaking? Do they, I've got the last three months, so maybe it should be the last six months, or maybe I shouldn't look at the last three months. Maybe I should just look at a category which says, is it increasing or decreasing? Getting to assess those features is something that is quite time consuming, is something that is um, it's a bit of an art form. So tools to help you do that and do that more sensibly are where this next section is. Being able to control how the features are put into the model, being able to understand which ones go in, which ones go out, which ones are far too highly correlated with the outcomes. Like, oh, we've left in something that was part of a business process that always has the same outcome for a decision that happens on a flow, for example, there's no point including both of those fields in there. We need some way of being able to see what's going on. But we also got the ability then to take away some of those blind spots that those people that have not spent their life doing data science, those are the sort of more business science people with domain knowledge, those people that are really understanding what it's like to be in the real world on that particular project, we need to give them some tools. So get some smarts in the background that do things like recommending buckets, find outliers for you, find dominant values, find out things that are perhaps too highly correlated, getting to find things that have got too many data points, it's too complex and we've now got far too little variability to work to in this model. Being able to get something that says, nah, 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 you've included this twice. Basically, you think they're similar, uh, sorry, different. They've got different labels, but I'm telling you statistically, there's no point having both of those in. Being able to find duplicate values and things. These are things that really, really break proper, usable, real world predictive models. We've got a load of smarts that will help you find all those and tidy all that up so that you're going to create a really good model. The story creation process has been encapsulated. It's not coding, it's just a wizard that takes you through it. You choose a target, you choose whether you're gonna have just insights only to find the drivers or whether you want to build a predictive model. And it will even go away and just build the first go for you, just completely automated. Or you can just then click on this and say, look, actually I wanna do a bit of interaction and check things out. You're dropped straight into a, 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 an area that allows you to see immediately what the highly correlated and the not so correlated drivers potentially are, but it also gives you an environment to take control of those. So like we are saying on the feature creation side of things, being able to see which things are bucketing up well, which things really sort of relate to that outcome. We've also got here that smart section in the background, helping the business scientists getting to understand that there's an awful lot of things here that, that you might not have spotted otherwise. I, you know, If you haven't studied data science, not to say that you shouldn't, I'm not to say that data scientists can't use this too. It's just a way of prompting and saying there's some things you might not have spotted. So have a look at these guys. And there's a whole range, as you saw, of different things that we'd be looking for in the background. They then come back right in your face. It tells you at the top of the side here, there's four recommended sets of updates. It tells you individually what they are. And then you can make decisions as to how to deal with them and then rebuild that model. You notice on that, uh, process here we've got it's iterative data preparation and data modeling goes backwards and forwards on that methodology we need tools that are flexible and, and iterative like that so that's how we've built that we're always trying to build the simplest the most explainable model and sometimes there's a competition between getting explainability versus something that is really a finely detailed super duper detail 
We could also, with too few records, we can also get into something that's overfitting. We've got to balance all of that. And that's what is being done in the background by using a load of, of model statistics, as well as the statistics around the, the data and the, the, the features themselves. What we see here is that we're going to start at the top and then we can go into interactions. We look at all possible interactions. We look for ones that are completely useless, that give absolutely no information. We'll discard those. So there's a huge amount of stats that happen in the background that normally you'd have to wade through yourself. We just do it all for you and put it all together inside that one sort of summary model, that story. We're using well-established data mining techniques in the background, allowing us to do things like K-fold, having validation and training samples being able to, to make sure that we're not overfitting, that we've got something that's representative in the real world. Again, it's all taken care of for you. Choice of models, we can have competition as well. We're starting to move on to some bring your own models into the system as well. What we've also got underneath that is a sort of a, a, a new part that we're working on is around ethical AI. And ethical AI is a, is a sort of a couple of things. And Salesforce's view is more about it, yes, you can declare something as like, say, gender is a really obvious one. So you don't want to discriminate. You absolutely do not want to discriminate within a model. But it would then, having declared that gender is something you want to watch out for and not include in the model, it will check reference against anything else that's in there and say, actually, you're still discriminating because those things are highly correlated to gender. So there's technical sides of things, but also it's a, it's a combination of of technician, technical things and also your approach as well. So we put forward, and there's, there's lots of documentation about it, but we put forward this sort of much wider view of ethical AI. It isn't just about inclusion or exclusion from a model. So tools and processes are, are getting deeper and wider to help the business scientists manage that. Model tournaments are part of what's going on, instantaneous model refresh, quiet model refresh in the background, and then your choice to go into production. Those model tournaments are a really big part of what's going on. The tools to enable you to iterate and to control versions are built in. It's nothing that we have to set on the side. There's no source safe or anything. It's part and parcel of this, this environment. Having the model refresh and getting to understand that the data has changed, therefore it's maybe time to go and refresh your model is again part and parcel. It's built into what's going on. We see here that we've got different kinds of models that you can choose or you can allow it to do what it wants, gives you strong feedback about how the model's being built, gives you confidence that what you're going to be using is going to be stable and valid in the real world. Here, not even being a statistician, you can get to see straight away, it'll, it'll give you a tick and says you've passed all the validation tests that it will do stats on the stats in the background for you. We also have things that are really important for production and where you've got things that have actually got a legal uh, context to them. Being able to control, understand, rewind back in versions, being able to describe to your colleagues what these different versions mean. Again, built straight into the application. Nothing really have to worry about it. Evaluation is the next, almost uh, to the last part, but evaluation is a really strong point of this toolkit. Getting to understand the model is good or bad or indifferent, we need a whole series of viewers and metrics. Being able to compare between stories, so I've got a new one, I want to compare with the one that's in production. How are they changing? Is the world changing? Is it the data? Am I just doing something different when I create my iterations? There's tools in this that allow you to really get to understand what it would be like if you were to put this into product, this model into production, getting to understand what predictions might look like and why they're driving the decisions as they are can be both individually, but also you can go back onto a top level, say maybe as a marketing decision and saying, I've got a what if scenario. If I've got three of these and two of those, what would be the likely outcome in that business decision? What would happen in the real world? These are tools that are baked into this application. Being able to, to bias where you're uh, having costly mistakes. I mean, mistakes always happen in the real world, but you can bias the cost of those mistakes and so and try and avoid certain expensive ones or dangerous outcomes. You can play around with that, that, uh, that model the way it's working. Uh, and there's also model cards which are allowing you to be able to give this and expose those to even business users throughout the system that are not part of the data science program, they can get to understand how well the models are working and have confidence that these things that, that can be worked on. The environment for assessing the, the, the model is twofold. First of all, we've got the story itself, which is the combination of all of those bits and, and pieces in the model. But also we've got this sort of uh, graphical view, the statistical, but there's also a graphical view. It's interactive, you can click around and you can have a look. You can even go and open it up and explore it back inside Analytics Studio for any one of these charts that you fancy. 
but we also have a model viewer as well, which gives us the, the, the real fine grain detail. Quite often, that's just a piece of output that sits in code, it sits there in some text file somewhere. We've given you viewers, we've given you a way of being able to really get to understand how the model is working and get to understand where the strengths and weaknesses are. We've got internal, as I mentioned before, internal validation to make sure that the model you've got is going to be something that's useful. It's not something that you should be worried about. It's a, it's a high amount of variance predicted. It's also got all this cross-validation testing. It's, it's, it's passed all of its internal tests. We, underneath that, we can start looking at how accurate it is on individual predictions, for example. So we can start to see the proximity to that, that reference line that we have there. We can look at that. Um, so there's a binary outcome in this one where we're looking at standard statistics and your false positives and false negatives. Those are important measures of what's going on. And gains charts, uh, we can look at uh, Gini curves. We can look at all sorts of statistics to go with that and modify the threshold so that we're avoiding certain kinds of outcomes. We also go down to that individual, as I said, that individual prediction. So we can see the data points and then see what the prediction might be for any one of those example records. We take it one stage further and start looking at individual hypothetical situations. Maybe you want to test this out and say, a decision might be made in the field on this, this, and this, and this is the thing that people are saying. You know, you can do it for like operational excellence and, and salespeople say, yeah, yeah, this, this, op this opportunity is gonna close, absolutely. And then you can punch in the figures and say, no, nah, it's not gonna close. Look, these are the kind of things that are going on. So you can use it as an educational tool if you wanted. These are just baked in. This is something that's part and parcel of what's going on. I, I've been doing this stuff all my adult life and, and I just never seen this kind of detail, never seen this level of understanding of what the model is and what, how it relates to the real world. We can take that even further. So when we've got that sort of view of the, the, the outcome and saying, okay, well, you've got a prediction of whatever, we can break that down into individual components so it's not just the individual field itself, because that is correlated with other potential predictors. You get to understand the real magnitude of individual elements of that, that um, opportunity, for example, or a sale or an account or whatever it might be. You can break it down to understand the individual value of any one of those data points. This is pretty special stuff. Again, all part and parcel of the toolkit. There's nothing extra, it's all part and parcel of it. Okay, no, so we're just coming up on time now. I want to go a little bit about that last mile. This is a really important part, and this is really where most analytical applications really fall over. A huge amount of money is spent getting the models built and getting to understand what the drivers are, but it then fails dismally in getting those models back into production, into the hands of the people that use it. So deployment is really, really important. We've built this into a complete wizard, and this wizard allows you to do things like actionable fields. It allows you to then say, if you were to make this decision like a next best action or something, this is the improvement you would get in your prediction. So the outcome, your, your outcome would be increased by a certain percentage, for example. The model manager is really important as part of this to understand how it's working in the field, making sure that this is, is really doing the job that you want it to. And we put it all together in what's called a predictions package. This package holds on to different elements of the whole of the predictive model. And that is a thing that then goes back into Salesforce and is controlled using different tools inside this toolkit. Segmented models are really important where you've got the same business outcome, but you've got different groups that need special treatment. It might be gold, silver, bronze for loyalty programs. They may have different data points or you might go through opportunities and have stages where you have more or less data points because they've been in the system longer. We can build different segmented models and have them all together in one package. Again, very difficult to do unless you've got this, this tight knit environment. We also then can put all of those prediction packages together to build this sort of much deeper view, this sort of next best action view. We can support that by using sort of multi prediction use cases as well. Business scientists not going to be interested in coding or technology. We stick it all behind inside a wizard. Inside the wizard, it helps you set up for deployment, but it then drops you into this predictions package that allows you to keep track of what's going on. We have three of them here. We've got three different prediction packages on this one particular Salesforce instance, different business outcomes, different targets that we've been looking at. Inside those, we've got different tools that enable us to keep track or modify or tweak or enhance those predictions that are working in the real world. And that can be right down to the individual segment or it can be at much higher level than the individual 
uh, prediction package itself. We've got this thing where we can do mapping and we can do the segments as well. That allows us to take control of which records are going to be scored. Great and good differential use because people make different decisions based on different record types, on different types of operations. Actionable fields are really important. They allow us to then take that action. If you do this, then your chance of success will be much improved. Or if you don't do this, then it will decrease the chance of this bad thing happening. So we can specify those uh, in advance and that helps us get to understand how to use the predictions. This is an example here of segmented modeling, all encapsulated inside the same package. This is very cool because you may get, for example, opportunities where they're just a single item, or you may get opportunities where they are based off lots of line items. They have different grains, they have different levels. We can bring them all together and then use them in that same package. Quite difficult to do unless you're doing it inside this package. Scoring. This is, again, somewhere where a lot of um, analytical applications for business science tend to drop out and, and become pretty useless or at least difficult to manage in the real world or expensive to, to manage in the real world. There are so many different options that you have available as part of this toolkit, all by default. There's things that you can work with straight away. On the individual record inside Salesforce, we can just have it there so that when you change some data values, you've got your latest prediction straight away. You've got on-demand scoring as well where you can just go ahead and say, like, I've got a whole bunch of people that just had data updates, I need to go and update those. There's inline scoring, which allows you to do um, uh, uh, as part of the data processing so that that data is available on all records. It's all up to date and done every night, say, for example. Programmatic scoring, where it can be called as part of uh, an, an API-led economy. Uh, that could be both inside Salesforce, but also could be outside, for example, Tableau integration, or building a new application that uses some elements of Salesforce, but is being called from an external source. Hybrid scoring, I've put this in big and bold because it's something I love. I get really boring about this, but this is mind blowing. This is something that has changed the landscape of, of, of how usable all of this scoring is. And what it means is that you can have some data sat in Salesforce, some data that's come from a completely external source and that can all be brought to bear on an updated real-time score. So hybrid scoring is to do with the mapping, but it's also to do with feature creation that doesn't have to burden Salesforce. There are things you can do inside this toolkit that you can't do inside Salesforce. And that is partly because the data might not be there, but also the way you look at data can be completely difficult, different from an analytical view rather than just an operational view inside Salesforce. So hybrid scoring is huge, absolutely massive. And that's something that we've been working on. The last few versions has just changed this whole prospect for business science. Being able to take all those data values and drop those right back into Salesforce is incredible. Having that as data sitting inside Salesforce is really incredible. New tools for going from our sandbox into production as well. And again, we've mentioned before about version control. Here's an example of our hybrid scoring that allows us to map data coming from different sources. What we see here is a toolkit that enables us to take control of that scoring and take control of things like the model refresh process. The final part here on the performance, uh, sorry, on the deployment is about performance monitoring. There are tools that are built into this that are part, they're absolutely integral to the toolkit. You don't have to go anywhere else. It will look at the outcome in the real world and say your model's fading a little bit, it's getting a bit weak, it's getting a bit stale. So these tools are just brought to bear and are absolutely part of your, your deployment. You can then use the other stuff that you'd be familiar with inside Tableau CRM, things like notifications, watch lists, subscriptions, enable you to keep track of what's going on. You see, for example, over here that we're seeing what the scoring has been doing, how many predictions you've had, any errors you might have on some of those data values. But we also have things like notify me if this changes, notify me if what? If the prediction actually decreases, maybe there's too many missing values. But this is a live organic system. It's keeping track of things. It isn't something that's sat on the side that all of this requires integration. This is absolutely part of the toolkit. The very, very last part of the whole experience is tying it all together back into, well, of course, we've just been spending the time as a business scientist. We've, of course, got to tie that back into that user experience. So having that real-time scoring, having that way of deploying that score back into that operation inside Salesforce is really important. And we do that by having some triggers on a page. We can have lightning components. We can have dashboards and we can have elements of the... Uh, the, the insights coming back in that experience inside that, that 
application that they're using, it be it sales, service, whatever it might be, we're putting it right back into that environment. In that action framework where we can take action straight away based off it, natural language so that it says, please do this. That's a recommendation that we can take there. Scores come back as data as well. So that can kick off things like next best action can be part of a flow, a flow process in the background. So here's an example of the action framework. This allows you then to sort of see something, take action straight away on the fact that that is a what the score is way below where it should be. Let me go open up and have a look and have a phone to someone or kick off a global process in there. We can put it together in dashboards, summarize it in a way that really makes sense. You don't want giving people stats. You want to give them a number, say good, it's green, it's red, it's whatever it is that points people in the right direction. Or we can give them that natural language and say, look, if you do this, then that's something that's really going to help you. So let's summarize that a little bit over time, but hopefully you've got, got all of that and I'm going a thousand miles an hour, but essentially I wanted to sort of set this session up to, as I say, to, to really get you a flavor of all the different things that we've been working on that are really packaged together to help the business scientist really do some very, very, very uh, detailed, some comprehensive uh, and sometimes quite complex things, but packaged up in a way that is absolutely in their train of thinking. It's not something that sits on the side, it is part and parcel of this whole world. So let's just have a, a sort of summary of what's going on for this business science approach that we're taking inside Salesforce. The toolkit's been put together to give you complete flexibility to tackle any of those decisions that you're using inside Salesforce. I mean, you can use it to anywhere across the Salesforce environment. Any decision that you're working on, you can support it using this toolkit. It's a single entry point. So you log in as a Salesforce user and all of the tools are available to you there. You're not application here, application there, integration. track. It's all part and parcel and it's all controlled by the security. You give who needs access, you know, give what access to whoever needs different kinds of access. This is, I hope you've seen it already, but this is professional quality stuff. This is exposing all of the nuts and bolts and widgets and all of the technical stuff in the background that data scientists need, but exposing it in a way that is a really nice workbench for those business scientists. They're not data miners, they're not data scientists, but it's being exposed in a way that really helps them. It's also, it's all proper technical stuff in the background, proper professional grade stuff. So it's there to be trusted and to be relied on. It is very, very quick. It's a matter of minutes or hours to go from an idea right the way through to having something that's implemented in Salesforce. I really don't recommend it. You've got to do it properly and you're going to take your time and it's got to be worked on as a whole process behind it. But the, the application should definitely not get in your way. This is designed to help speed up that process and, and work a little more at your train of thought. But you can drop it right back into the heart of that business process, wherever it may be. We've got variants, we've got versions, we've got segments, we've got hybrid mapping. We can deploy to any object and we can score in any which way you fancy. How incredible is that? That is something that most applications that sit on the side won't be able to do, won't be able to manage as part of that native experience. That problematic last mile is something we're spending a lot of money on. That last mile problem is going away. We eat it up. It's something that we're getting more and more tools and making it much, much easier to do. It's native, it's not integration. It's simple and it's predictable in terms of licensing and how you run the whole process. And the total cost of ownership is very, very obvious as well. It's really, really clear as to what the elements you're paying for, which are very few. There's only a couple of licenses that you can choose from. And then once you're in there, you've got a few settings so you can distribute this around to whomever needs it. It's very, very simple. It's not all quiet, other applications, hardware, software, different people in different parts of the business. It's part of the Salesforce environment. So as a consequence, very, very easy to use. It gives you that native intelligent analytics that can sit across the entire Salesforce workforce. So here we see Einstein here just saying, come in, have a go, have a try. It's much, much easier than you probably think it is, but you've got yourself an incredible toolkit at your fingertips. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. Thanks again to the sponsors for making this event happen. And uh, I think we'll be handing over so that we've got some time for questions.